So you might want to refrain from dropping any F bombs at this point. I'll, <laughs> Someone's going to hack in. That's right. <laughs> so um, let me explain kind of who we are, what we're doing here. Back when I first joined the CPA firm, they brought me in as a marketing director, and I had no marketing experience yet. I had a high salary and a lot of expectations on my performance. And so I didn't get the bullet in the back of the head. I had to every month bring in a PR expert or a website expert to teach me how to do my job effectively for that month. And we started with a very small, informal peer support group of about 12 people. And over the next five or six years, through cache invitation only, we grew to a few thousand in the um, Philly, Baltimore, D.C. area. And we had programming up to about two or three events a month. And we didn't charge for it. We had a hard and fast rule. It's for peer support, for education, and no sales. If you try to sell somebody something, we'd kick you out in a heartbeat. So it was a safe place for people to go and exchange ideas and collaborate and what have you. Um, when I joined Farm Credit, um, I didn't really have a need for the group. So it kind of fell to the wayside. But our LinkedIn group kept on growing. So on LinkedIn, we've got about 55,000 members in this marketing group, which is insane to even think about that number. And it got real special spammy over the years and as I didn't have time to clean it up so what I did was I turned it off I turned off the ability for anyone to post or join the group without my permission and so the core group of us who started this way back in the day got together and said hey you know let's bring this thing back so we're using LinkedIn the LinkedIn group as our platform so all those 55,000 members are basically captive they can only respond and read what we post and we'll let them comment but we're not gonna let them post or anything like that but we want to bring back these educational capsules and as you know Christine and Colin and Allison um, I'm very involved in the the founder CEO startup world and there's so many needs for marketing um, information education support in those sectors um, that I, I kind of listened to what you all said and that media 101 what to do in the reporter calls because um, if you haven't gotten a big check a big cardboard check on the stage yet there's probably one in your near future for for both those on the call here and those that have been watching the recording and when you get off that stage in addition to investors reporters are going to ask you questions and how do you frame that response do you respond immediately there you go that cut that cardboard check could have your name on it with a few extra zeros. You never know. Um, but what? How do you respond? Zeros would be nice. <laughs> yeah. So I am so fortunate to know Henry here, and and Henry was it's so gracious to volunteer to to jump in here. And if you read his bio, um, it's I think he is understated. He is. If there's something that you need to touch, reach, or know about, Henry's got a way to find it. And he he certainly has very specific industries that he deals with. Uh, but I just I really appreciate and enjoy listening to him talk, and I always learn something as well. Um, but before I turn the mic over to him, um, I'm going to let everyone who's on the call here have the ability to introduce themselves and let folks know um, who you are and, and, and what it is that you do. Um, Allison, since you're back from Costa Rica and all refreshed, why don't you let us know who you are and what you do? Sure. And I don't have like a stack of those checks sitting around. I just have one. It's from grad school decades ago. So, okay. um, Allison Hahn, I'm the executive director of Grow North. Um, we're a nonprofit initiative out of the Home Center of Entrepreneurship at the Carlson School of Business at the U of M. So kind of a three level inception down and really really focused on uh, supporting food and ag startups. Um, so we do that through education, resources, connectivity, uh, events, networking, and all of those things. I host a quarterly investor meeting, which is how I know Andrew. Um, so we, we convene anywhere from 20 to 50 investors, have someone rotate hosting, and it's basically just a nice time for people to network and connect. And there's no entrepreneurs pitching there's no, you know it's very low stakes um, in terms of that so investors like it it's a nice way to network um, but a lot of what we do we interface with a lot of organizations around the state and regionally um, and even nationally and so there's a lot of opportunity for um, cross-pollination of ideas for collaboration on programming and just you meet a ton of people at all times and so I'm excited to hear this as um, there are often times where we'll run into you know newspaper reporters and things like that and we want to chat and you know you always want to make sure you give the best version of whatever story you're trying to tell so i'm excited to learn a little bit more about the different strategies here 
Excellent. Thank you, Allison. And I'll put a link to um, to join Grow North in the chat. Again, this is not a sales thing, but you know that was one of the first places I joined when I left Farm Credit because I so much appreciate the conversations that happen up there. They're very well curated, and the, the, the subject matters are fun. And every once in a while, Allison makes a mistake of giving me a microphone, which is always a, a hoot to begin with. So, Colin, who are you? What do you do? So, who am I and what do I do? So, my name is Colin Hamill. Um, so, for more than 15 years, I've been an enterprise solutions architect, designing IT solutions for large companies, um, for servers, storage, you know, all the big blinking boxes that we put in closets. And I thought that was my dream job. Colonial Pipeline attack last year was sort of my wake up call where a pipeline company having a little bit of a whoopsie in Pennsylvania meant that I could not put fuel in my wife's car. And it was a big deal. It really shook me. And then I met Andrew and he told me, yeah, you know, what's even more important than fuel food. We lose our food supply. We're all dead in three weeks. And I thought about it because farmers, as you may or may not know, are not really cutting edge when it comes to investing in computers. They consider the term IT to be jargon. So I really had to learn to modulate my speech for, frankly, normal people um, and realize how much jargon we actually say. But my product is the Sentinel Box service. Uh, it's based upon my proprietary cybersecurity architecture that I developed uh, that is designed for basically protecting smaller organizations and large organizations. Uh, the same system would protect my parents, my, my in-laws house, but it could also be scaled up to protect the largest businesses that are out there. Uh, and the sort of, the trick is that we, I've learned from our attackers, we share information. So an attack on any of these deployments is considered an attack on all. And anyone who is subscribing to this is entitled to any sort of countermeasures or um, things we learn about the attackers. And as bad guys keep attacking these vulnerable networks, we will learn more and more with an idea that hacking will no longer be a profitable thing. So looking forward to working with everyone and learning how to speak with reporters. Um, I, I, spoke, I speak for a living for the most part, but I've never spoken to the press. And I know that there people like me can easily get in trouble if they are too wordy. Um, so looking forward to this. Very cool. Thank you, Colin. And Christina. Hey. Hi, everyone. My name is Christina Christman, and uh, I'm the co-founder and the CEO of the Repurpose Farm Plastic, uh, which is a startup that we are designing a small scale cleaning technology um, for plastics used in agriculture, specifically the plastic films and uh, irrigation tubes. And uh, so the design is the result of a year long research that actually uh, Andrew's been part of that year long <laughs> journey. And he, he was a tremendous help for us. And so we conducted interviews with, with the farmers and the, the experts in the industry, uh, municipalities, government officials. And we, we concluded that like the, the best solution is because the United States is such a diverse landscape that you have to solve this problem locally with, with local solutions. So you cannot invest into like a million dollar uh, cleaning machinery to a smaller state like Maryland versus to California where there is like a huge quantity in small um, uh, proximity. So we believe that like our design would be a great solution and we are going to test it out at the University of Maryland research farms at the fall. And then if we are going to succeed, then it could be like a great example of how to uh, expand uh, uh, every smaller states uh, like, the, um, like Maryland, for example. Or South Carolina. Yeah, or any of these. Or, or Minnesota, I'm sorry, or Minnesota, of course. Christina, on a sidebar, um... So I sit on a coalition called Embold, which is all the major food and companies in Minnesota. So General Mills, Cargill, Land O'Lakes, Schwann's, Compure Financial, on and on. And one of their uh, pillars is around a circular economy, around flexible film. And they've got some work going towards that, that they'll be announcing in the next month here. Um, and it's partially a recycling piece of it. But and so it's like the demand on recycling flexible film and then also creating something with it and finding uses for that and people who are willing to take it. But um, obviously that is a regional play, but there might be some interesting parallels or things there to be discussed. So if you are interested or curious, I can connect you on some of those things. Yeah, definitely. I will, I will connect you after this call. Yeah. Thank you. And I put a link to Embold in the chat box there too. 
I wanted to share real quick. My friend actually has a startup called Renegade Plastics, which is also dealing with the, the industrial plastics. They have some proprietary space age plastic, better plastic that he's creating a closed loop for, and he's looking for ways to do that. Um, if you're interested in hearing, it sounds like you're, it's the same sort of target market. Um, if that would be something you'd be interested in. Yeah. I'm not, I run the e &I pillar, the entrepreneurship and innovation pillar for them, um, but I can certainly connect you with the right people on the flexible phone one. Awesome. It's a lot of fun. Anyway, we're all here to hear from Henry. It, we're, you know, as much as we enjoy our lives and all the things that we're involved with, Henry is the star today, and I am so happy to to bring him forth here. Henry is kind of one of my, I guess we're recording this, but I'll say it out loud anyway. He's one of my secret weapons. If I need to put a finger on the pulse of what's happening in the politics of Maryland, I buy Henry a cup of coffee, and he just tells me what the outcome's going to be before the votes are cast. He just has this magical ball of understanding which way the wind's blowing in the political world but he is also a master of media. That's why I'm so pleased to have you here. And Henry, I'll shut up and let you say anything you want to say about yourself before you get rolling. Oh, this is great. It's been uh, very cool to hear what everybody uh, here on the call is doing as well as somebody who started a company 11 years ago. It's always great to hear about folks um, doing the same and helping to build um, companies and ideas and movements from the ground up. So um, I wish everybody a uh, great luck and, and hopefully uh, I can impart some some value today. Um, just a quick background kind of on me, how I um, got to this point. So I founded Campfire Communications uh, 11 years ago. Um, and we are, we're a full service strategic communications firm. So um, we help companies kind of develop their strategic communications plans. We help them with their uh, media outreach and media relations. We help them with their message development, uh, which is really kind of understanding kind of who they are, what their value is, and then marrying that with who their target audiences are as well, uh, and trying to do that in a really cohesive uh, and thoughtful way. Uh, we help with digital marketing, um, you know, the collateral design and development. We also help a lot with like stakeholder relations and coalition building in particular. Um, you know, anytime you have like an idea or a movement or a policy that you want to get move, move that forward, building a coalition to help kind of create momentum um, is incredibly valuable, but also takes a lot of time and a lot of thought for how to like manage a coalition of dozens of organizations in a cohesive way. So that's what Campfire does. Um, but as Andrew said, my roots are really in media relations. So I, uh, I started out on Capitol Hill uh, working as a uh, press secretary for two members of Congress. Uh, the member of Congress I was working for at the time became, was elected governor of Maryland. So I moved out um, to work in the governor's office as his press secretary, which was a huge wake up call. It's one thing to be a press secretary to one of 535 members of Congress, where for the most part, no one really cares too much what one member of Congress thinks. Uh, whereas working for a governor, you're you're one of one in your state. And there were days where you, you could hardly get out of bed without getting a text from a reporter about, you know, the day's events and needing comment. So, um, so I learned a lot. I made all the mistakes you can imagine making, um, made them early, made them often. Um, but that's also a big reason why I can impart these lessons, why I felt comfortable starting a company, because I, I learned them pretty early in my career. I was thrown to the wolves uh, by my boss, the director of communications. He had, he had previously served as a press secretary to a, a prior governor, so he knew how awful it was. So he was like, I'm going I'm to let the new guy handle this. I'm going to go do more interesting stuff. Um, so he threw me to the wolves and that was honestly, it was a gift. It was hard at the time, but it was a gift because I learned everything pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so anyways, that's my background. And obviously, as I said today, we continue to help clients deal with, um, media, uh, inquiries on a regular basis. So I thought it would be uh, fun today just to kind of walk through like, what is media today? Because that definition is radically different than it was when I, um, first started, um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then I thought it would also be fun to like kind of walk through a day. Like if you get a call tomorrow morning from media, what's, what is that day going to look like? So we'll kind of walk through what a typical day may look like from a media perspective. And then 
I'll disappear behind uh, some slides here for a few minutes, but um, would love to answer any questions and continue the conversation after that. So let me uh, pull my screen up. Hopefully you all can see that. All right, so, all right, so as I said, let's kind of start with what is the media today? Um, it's changed radically. I think the simplest way to start is I kind of put them in four different buckets. Uh, the first bucket there on the left is traditionally known as print media. It's kind of a misnomer now since print media, nobody really prints anything anymore, or at least that's a very small um, size of their, their market. Um, but for, you know, for simplicity's sake, there's kind of key, this is the New York Times, this is the Washington Post, uh, you know, this is, you know, Forbes, for instance, which still, you know, has a heavy print presence, um, Wall Street Journal, folks like that, and your community, your community newspaper and your, your uh, major metropolitan area. That's kind of what is defined as print. These are the folks who generally when they're calling, they have a pretty quick deadline. More often than not, it is that day, but not always. Um, they're also the more thorough of, um, in terms of kind of what they cover and how thorough they cover it. Um, what's interesting is, you know, it's, we've all probably read the coverage about how print media is in decline, and there's an element of truth to that, but what folks, I don't think they fully appreciate is just how influential these you know, media, um, New York Times, Washington Post, but even the local community newspapers, how influential they are and how other media covers something. So for instance, even though television gets the lion's share of audience, just watch your local television for 30 minutes, your local news affiliate for 30 minutes, a lot of what they're covering, they picked up in that morning's newspaper. So even if print media's, you know, market share has declined quite a bit, they still have a good deal of influence over how an issue is covered by other media because they're just more thorough in how they cover it. So that's one bucket. Is print Henry, Henry, quick question for you. Um, I was recently interviewed by someone, a reporter for Scripps, and it was like a, an aggregator. Um, the interview that was given appeared in multiple print um, uh, areas. I don't know if you're going to cover that in this, or this um, slide or not, yeah. but I'm just curious about that sort of reuse of quotes in different markets. Yeah, great question. So you do, and I generally would put them and the Associated Press in kind of loosely defined the print bucket. And they are different in that um, other news outlets subscribe to the Associated Press and subscribe to scripts for content. If you're a small community newspaper in Idaho, you don't have the budget to send somebody to cover Congress. So wow. you then subscribe to Scripps, who has hundreds of subscribers, maybe thousands of subscribers around the country, um, for them to have somebody covering Congress on a regular basis. And that way you get easy content um, that you've paid for covering Congress that you didn't have to actually send somebody out to Washington to pay for. Um, so that is why you would see, if you get interviewed by one reporter, you may see that quote get picked up dozens of times. Scripps and the Associated Press are two, the two most obvious examples of that. There are, um, one interesting model is wow. universities, wow. journalism schools have started wow. frequently, started their own um, wire services as well, wow. where wow. their journalism, their graduate students wow. who are, uh, wow. will out, go out and cover wow. the news. Wow. And then they will then have subscribers around that particular state or that particular demographic market who subscribe to that coverage and they can use it as well. Um, so yeah, that is that is why you saw the same article get picked up so many different times was it's basically a subscription service. Um, and those are really important, uh, obviously, and can dramatically increase kind of your, your audience that you reach. Um, so anyway, so electronic media, again, this is kind of television and radio. These are the folks who usually do have the quickest deadlines. Um, very, it's rare that they are calling you because they want an interview next week. They usually need it today. Um, their deadlines are a little different because they need to actually edit video and record their own, uh, you know, voiceover for their pro for their uh, segment. 
that takes a lot more time. So usually with, with them, they've got very quick deadlines, um, you know, usually like two or three o'clock at the latest for television. Um, they're also a little less thorough. Um, and that's just the nature of television, especially like local news. You know, very often it's 15 seconds, 30 seconds. Sometimes it's two minutes if you're lucky. Um, but getting back to this idea of being super, super simple, uh, which was mentioned earlier, um, television is the one where I think you need to be most mindful about kind of approaching it from a headline perspective rather than a um, you know, deep in-depth discussion uh, approach. So the third bucket I would put in here is trade media. Um, this, these are the folks who are very industry focused. You know, these are the, fo the folks who cover cyber security. All they do is cover cybersecurity or IT or agriculture or energy, whatever it may be. Um, they usually have longer lead times. If they're covering something day of, they may just literally be grabbing your press release that you put out and posting it verbatim. Um, that tends to be how they operate. You'll also see more what we call pay to play, where they, they rely heavily on industry advertising. Um, and sometimes buying a good bit of advertising will make it easier for them to cover you from an editorial perspective. Or you can even just flat out buy sponsored articles. Um, they, it's kind of a different model and a different standard than say your local newspaper where it's a lot, you can buy sponsored content with your local newspaper, but it's, it's less necessary, I think. Uh, and then the fourth, uh, the fourth bucket here, of course, um, is digital. And this is relatively new. This is, these are your blogs, these are your podcasts. Um, there's a great deal of flexibility here. Again, these usually are not gonna be day of um, deadlines. There's gonna be a longer lead time. There's also tends to be a little bit more pay to play, particularly with podcasts. Um, one of the blessings and the burdens are there's no editor um, with most of these blogs and um, blogs and podcasts. And that, that can be a good thing. That can be a not good thing, depending on their, their angle and their interest. So, um, all these other folks, they have editors and they will, you know, the editors are there to kind of play gatekeeper to make sure that the coverage is, is fair uh, to everybody. So those are kind of the four, um, the four buckets. So as I said, I want to kind of walk through like, what does the day look like uh, when you get a call? And I think the most important place to start is actually before that day. <laughs> so the most important thing that you can do in terms of effective media communications is to just plan ahead. You know, use the time when media are not calling to really think about how you want to do it from a thoughtful way so that you're not scrambling uh, later when they are actually calling. Uh, I love this line from Pedro Guerrero, former baseball great. And I think it, you know, I, I've been there where, where I thought I said something, but I really didn't. Um, and I see that with clients all the time where they don't take the interview seriously enough or they treat it like they're talking to one of their customers or like they're talking to their employees or like they're talking to somebody they've known for a long time and they end up regretting it when they see the actual coverage. So this is what I call zero hour, which really frankly occur, should occur before you're getting the call is where you make sure that you say what you mean so that they write what, they, what you want or what you said. Um, so that just starts with identifying your communications team. This may decide a little bit on the size of your venture. It may just be one person. Uh, it may be five or six, depending on the issue. I would, I strongly recommend keeping that a lean team because I've seen having too many people involved can really slow things down and um, uh, be more hurtful than helpful. So try to put together a lean team of people who you think um, by just their, their skills and their experience or just by intuition are gonna have a better sense of how to make sure you project the best foot forward. That's number one. Number two, do some media training. Help, help your team understand like what the role of media is. Media does not work for you. You do not call media and tell them that you would like them to write a nice story about your company. That's not how it works. That's, that's called an advertisement. You can buy an advertisement whenever you want, but it costs money. Um, I believe it or not, still every once in a while, we'll encounter a company that is under the assumption that media works for me or works for them. Um, so kind of helping them understand the basics of how media works 
walking through some simulated media interviews. What do we think? What are some of the you know, top 10 to 20 questions we're most likely going to be asked, including the questions we're not, we hope we don't get asked, the questions that are uncomfortable. Um, in fact, those are the most important ones to think about. And then just basic blocking and tackling, developing a media page on your website um, that identifies who a reporter should contact. Um, that includes like a little media kit that's very basic, like here's who we are as a company, here's some awards we've done, here's the products and services that we offer. Um, that just provides really important context to media before they even reach out to you. Um, one thing I really try to stress with folks is I can't underestimate or, or overstate you know, how under-resourced reporters are these days. Many of them are writing three or four stories at once. A lot of them are relatively young, kind of the older experienced reporters have taken buyouts. So the folks who may have the most institutional knowledge about your company or your industry are gone. So there's a lot of younger reporters who may not have that knowledge. The more you can provide it for them proactively, the better it's gonna be for you, your company and your coverage. Henry, quick question. Um, I, I apologize. I had to jump out and jump back in again. Um, one of the things that I ask people to do when they're going to be talking to the media is think in sound bites. You know, yep. it seems that the, the you put that bait on the hook, that's the thing that's going to get printed, especially if you if put some thought behind it. And I distill very complicated things down to almost like biblical parables. Here is an example, and it's always nice when those come in. Is that something that you counsel your, your um, clients I to do, do as well? I do, and you'll see in a minute kind of how we try to structure that. Um, but yes, the short answer is yes. So we'll get, we'll get to that. Uh, all right. So let's assume it's day of, you've gotten the call. First off, you got to respond fairly quickly. Um, again, I, I kind of, I was raised in this environment where like I couldn't get a cup of coffee without having a reporter kind of nab me and start asking me questions. So it was a wake up call for me getting out of that environment to start my own company and start working with clients who understandably don't have the same sense of urgency um, when a reporter calls because they may only get three or four reporter calls a year. And the, their mindset was like, I'm busy, I'll get to it when I get to it. That can lead to bad coverage. Again, reporter doesn't work for you. They don't need your permission um, to write about you. If you don't respond by their deadline, they are perfectly free to write. This company did not respond to repeated phone calls and emails for comment, and that's a bad look. So this gets back to that idea of media training and like making sure somebody in your company is empowered to number one, get those inquiries and empowered to kind of change the priorities of the day if need be with other people in order to make sure you respond appropriately to that, to that reporter. Make sure you get their deadline, Again, very often it's hours away, figure out what they're writing about. Sometimes reporters are very vague and it's not, they're not trying to be evasive. They're just busy. Um, so ask questions, get as much detail as you can about you know, where the story idea originated from, who they've talked to, things like that. Um, it just helps, it helps you help them get all the information that they're looking for. Um, all right, so number, yeah. So you've, you've responded to the reporter, hopefully, relatively quickly that day, you've convened your team, even if it's just you or one or two other people, you start to identify your message, write it down and keep it simple. I'm gonna talk about this in greater detail in the next slide. Some other basic logistics, like figure out the format. So, you know, media interviews, like everything else in the world are not immune to kind of the Zoom takeover. Prior to the pandemic, I would say probably 90% of TV interviews I was involved in were on location somewhere. You know, the TV reporter was going to you, you were going to the studio, and you were doing it in person. Today, I would say that's probably 40% of the time. So I have a, a lot of clients where they're just not in the market of the television station uh, that wants to interview them. And the, the, honestly, I think the TV stations are fine with it. So they just send them a Zoom link. Um, and the interview is done in 10 minutes. So just figure that out, figure out kind of that format. Can you do Zoom? Should it be over the phone? A lot of times you can just do it over email. 15 minutes before this presentation started, I got an email from a reporter who was on deadline. He's like, I know it's 11 o'clock. I have a deadline at 12.30. Here are four questions I need answered by your client. Uh, fortunately, I knew the answers to most of them. So I drafted them, sent it to my client and just said, here's the deadline. You know, can you just look this over? 
change the responses as deemed appropriate. Uh, so a lot of times when reporters are under tight deadlines, email's perfectly fine. Um, there's a lot of talk about ground rules. Should this be off the record? Should it be on background? Honestly, the vast majority of the time, just be on the record. Unless this is a super sensitive issue, there's not really a need to be going um, on the record, or excuse me, off the record. Most reporters are just trying to write a fair story and just need a little bit of comment. So I, from a ground rules perspective, I generally recommend just keeping things on the record. There are certain circumstances where that may not be the case. You can do a quick Google search on the reporter to figure out kind of what's their, what's their history of coverage? How do they cover this issue? Are they sloppy? Are they snarky? Are they fair? All those are perfectly legitimate questions and you can generally get a good sense before um, talking to them uh, or doing the interview with them just with a quick Google or Twitter search. Um, if you're one, doing... one thing I'll jump in here and add really quickly, we're seeing on the cybersecurity side that a lot of our um, adversaries are using both real and faux reporters as an entry point into um, businesses or organizations. So I don't know, you know, you, went, you said go back and, and Google or look up the reporter. We do that frequently, just to ensure that they are legitimate, that the, or, um, the publication or organization they're representing is legitimate. Just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily going to be an overall um, threat area, but it's something just to be aware of. Yeah, I agree. And funny, a funny story, uh, a client of mine got, they had a big, they had a write-up in the Wall Street Journal, which was great. And the next day, they got an email from a producer of the Kathy Ireland show. I don't know if you all remember Kathy Ireland, um, you know, famous supermodel many years ago. And now she has this pay to play television show where companies have to pay her like $60,000 for this glowing 30 minute or hour long interview. And so my client got the email and freaked out and was like, oh my God, we're going to be on the Kathy Ireland show. Uh, you know, we got to stop everything right now and figure this out. And then before they sent it to me, did a quick Google search and quickly saw that like, this is a pay to play and it's going to cost you a ton of money. And it's not really what we're trying to do. Um, so just a little, a little Google search can go a long way sometimes in figuring out precisely who's reaching out to you. Okay. So Moving on, so getting back to what um, Andrew mentioned in terms of like your actual message. The Air Force has a great line when they start training their officers, their higher ups who are gonna be doing a lot of media interviews. One of their key lines is talk headlines, not history. Um, this is, I, I consider this an act of generosity, not just to reporters, but to your audience as well to not get bogged down in a ton of detail, unless it's number one, advantageous to you, and number two, the reporter like wants to go there. So um, there's a great, um, I've seen research that shows if you go back to, I think it was the 1960 presidential debate between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon, the average soundbite in that debate between the two candidates was 45 seconds. So they were able to talk for 45 uninterrupted seconds. Um, actually, no, it wasn't the debate, excuse me. It was the actual television coverage of the two, which is very, very different. Uh, as they were out on the campaign trail, they got 45 seconds whenever they were out on the campaign trail to say whatever they wanted uninterrupted on, on the evening news that night. Today, that soundbite is seven seconds long. So you've lost like 80% of your window to convey your message. So if you've got seven seconds to say something, that's the equivalent of 25 words. So I like to think of this kind of message framework, which you should be working on before media calls and certainly before any media interviews. It's like, what is my, what is this message pyramid that I'm gonna use to convey my message in really digestible um, information, sound bites for lack of a better word. So you'll see kind of this inverted pyramid here. You start with the headline, the who, the what, the when, the where. You know, my company today announced this new product. Um, my company today broke ground on this big project. And, you know, the next, the next pillar in the pyramid is, you know, we're, we're creating X number of jobs and investing this much in the community. And you kind of, you have your bullets for each one of these pyramids. And depending on the interview, 
they may only need two or three of those of those blocks in the pyramid. And sometimes they may need more. Sometimes an interview lasts three minutes. Sometimes an interview lasts 30 minutes. It just depends on the topic. But I would kind of structure as you're putting together your message, think about it in this kind of inverted pyramid where you first you start talking in headlines and keep it super simple. And then you have your next block of like, what's the really important information that, that supports that headline. Um, and that way, like when you watch your evening news tonight, um, you, you'll get a much better sense that that average soundbite is seven seconds long. And more likely than not, it's that second pillar, that important information. The reporter themselves is the one who's going to kind of be reporting on that headline, but it, it's always good for you to reiterate it just to help kind of reinforce that message with them. And then it's that second line that ends up often being the talking point. So um, usually when I am helping a client with an interview, we make sure we've got all these, I call them top lines. So what are, what's your top line message? We've got one or two of those and then lots of supporting bullet points down below. Um, so that's generally how I would approach like putting together my message. Are there any, any questions on that? Okay. Do you have someone like I'm assuming you would say best practices to actually practice this out loud with someone to oh, keep yeah. it tight? Because I feel like I would have it written down and then I would just start filling in as I get nervous or forget something. And then you start going off track and all of a sudden your seven second sound bite is still 30 seconds. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that gets back to uh, what I mentioned on the zero hour slide, this media training. Mm -hmm. One of the hardest things to do, not just with media interviews generally, but um, anywhere, frankly, is stopping. <laughs> it's, and reporters are really, really good at the pregnant pause. Like if they want you to continue talking and you stop, they just don't say anything for five seconds. And I can't tell you how many times it works. And the person being interviewed then just keeps talking. <laughs> What's your magic phrase for when you're like, I'm done? Are you, are you like, that's, that's the end of my comment? Silence. Yeah. You have to. I, awkward learned, silence going. Love that. Match, it's my favorite yeah. tactic in networking events, online and virtual world. I'm just going to let it be quiet for 15 seconds till someone feels compelled to say something. Right. I'll, I'll match your pregnant pause with my pregnant pause is basically what it comes down to. Um, and it is, again, I've, I've been there in the beginning when it's all kind of relatively new and it is awkward um, at first. But um, you start to get used to it because you know, in the instance where a reporter's doing that, you know what they're doing. And it's like, okay, you know, let's move on. Hey, so, Barry, yeah. Quick, quick question. Would you, what do you think about the idea of asking if that answered their question? Like when you're done, when you've said your piece, like, have I answered your question? Would you just force them to put them on the spot? Um, you could, but then it prompts them to say, not really, especially if, it depends on kind of the nature of the question and the nature. If this is a pretty easy interview, um, sure. If this is a more sensitive interview where you know you need to be pretty darn disciplined, um, I wouldn't do that. No. Uh, okay. Uh, again, it depends. And I, you know, my, my sense from our introductions is I don't think any of you all are going to be in like terribly hot water um, in terms oh, of <laughs> intense media scrutiny. So this, Yes, in that instance where it's a super easy, like low stakes in terms of um, what's being discussed, yes, you want to make sure they've got all the information that you need. There are other instances where I've helped clients in really delicate situations where they need to be really disciplined. Um, Paul, you mentioned earlier on that you've had some people who just go in like they're talking to a friend, they get too comfortable, and then they overshare or don't state things as they would like recorded. Um, I'm curious, you know, obviously the nature of the interview really impacts, you know, how serious or not and, and your relationship with that interviewer. Um, I feel like I tend to be more friendly and open. And so for me, that is a personal watch out if I want to make sure I don't overshare, don't say too much. Is there something or tools, tricks, things that you have or you share with clients where you're like, this is how you need to keep your mindset or this is how you treat it? Or, you know, is there anything along those lines to... Make sure people don't jump into the, the friend zone and over yes. 
Well, number one, that's the first part is don't try to be their friend. It's not to say years down the road, if you don't cultivate the relationship, you can't be friends or that they're not worthy of a friendship. That's not what it is at all. But I've seen, especially coming out of politics, I've seen time and time again, where people who are used to being very popular and very liked want to win, people, win journalists over. Um, and that's just not, um, that's not, their, their job is not to be won over. It's usually quite the contrary. It's to try to be, you know, the, the skeptic. So, um, so that's number one. And then number two, I would always remember that when you're talking with a journalist, while you want to be respectful to the journalist, they're not your audience. Your audience is your customer. Your audience is your stakeholder. It's your investor. So you're talking to them. And then the last point I would make is like, if you don't, if you don't want it written, don't say it. It's, you know, it's called the headline test. If you don't want being in the headline, don't say it. No matter how trivial it may be. There is a good example um, years ago. I'm sure you all remember the IRS had a massive data breach. Here, I'll stop sharing so that you all can actually see me. Um, and we'll, we can bring it back up. Uh, the IRS had this massive data breach uh, many years ago. And the head of the IRS rightly so, I held a conference call with members of the media to kind of walk through um, what was happening. And somehow, I can't remember, she started doing like math in her head as part of her response. And she was like, oh, I don't know, I'm terrible at math. Well, she's the head of the IRS and this is in the midst of a massive data breach. And she's talking about how terrible she is at math with you know, two dozen reporters from all over the world. And that just went viral. And was it unfair and was it peripheral to the larger issue? Yes, but did it paint a caricature of the IRS at the last worst possible time? Yes. So um, that's just a good reminder that like, I'm sure she was trying to be funny. I'm sure she was trying to break the tension. It didn't work. So uh, always be respectful to journalists. There's nothing wrong with becoming friendly with a journalist as you cultivate a relationship over the long term, but especially in the beginning, the first few times you've talked to them, just remember like, this is, this is a business, a quick business transaction, usually, um, especially it could be a matter of a few hours and you never hear from them again, depending on the circumstances. You have no obligation to win them over um, other than just being professional and serving the interests of your, your organization. That help? All right, let me see if I can bring this back up. Okay, so again, kind of think about this as an inverted pyramid, being super simple and disciplined about what it is you want to share. Again, I consider it an act of generosity to be simple and plain in how we speak, not just to a reporter who may not know much about what they're covering, uh, but also to the audience. So um, just try to think of it in, in that way in terms of being concise and the less the better. All right, so you're actually doing the interview now. Let's say it's one o'clock. This is kind of ideal time, whether it's TV or print. Uh, as I mentioned, TV loves to just have their interviews done by like, you know, three o'clock-ish. So they've got, you know, a couple hours to actually put their piece together. Same with a reporter. Um, it's totally okay to ask to record a, a um, media interview. In many instances, the reporter may ask to um, record it, obviously, we're all required by law to ask before recording it, so make sure you do. Um, I think it's really helpful. I did this the other day, and I'm glad I did it with a client where um, the, the coverage ended up showing something. I was like, I don't remember him saying that. And I went back and I checked the transcript, and he actually he did say it, so it was fine. And it wasn't terribly, it wasn't a big deal. I just wanted to make sure. So very often, I'm glad that I have recorded um, messages and honestly sometimes it's helpful to the reporter They're like great yeah can you shoot me a link to the recording when it's done because i'd like to have it too uh again stick to your message anything you say can be printed focus on headlines not on history unless like it's mutually beneficial to you and the reporter to kind of go into some history write down follow-ups this can be helpful you know if you're particularly busy or you're getting a lot of calls that day about from media like to have an extra person on to just write down there's always not always but a lot of times there's follow-ups 
where a reporter will say, yeah, can you please send me that? I'd love to see this report that you mentioned. Can you send me a link? It's really helpful to just kind of be mindful of writing down action items that come from that, um, that interview or having somebody else on the call to do that for you. It's totally okay to ask when the story will run. And then again, with TV, you know, kind of dress the part. Just remember like you're gonna be, you know, thousands of people will be seeing you or, or many more. Um, think about backdrop as well. If they're, if they're gonna be seeing you on location somewhere, try not to do it, you know, um, like in your, in your office, if you can help it, try, if you can do it at a, a really nice, if you've got, I'm just making this up, but a cool data center or a farm or uh, whatever it may be, something that looks nice in the background. That's what, uh, television loves that. Television is, there is an element of entertainment and presentation with um, television that you just don't have anything else. And so you kind of need to play the part of the presenter um, as well. And finding a, back, a nice backdrop is doing a reporter a big favor. <clears throat> um, just a few more kind of do's and don'ts. Um, some of, most of which we've talked about on the do side. For kind of some of the trickier interviews you may do, again, I, I suspect most of you are gonna be okay, but there are times where you get pressed on tough situations. It's perfectly okay to not get led around by the nose by a reporter on kind of tough or controversial stuff. And you'll, you'll hear this referred to as the pivot. Uh, people have different ways of pivoting back to their message. For me, you know, I'll give you an example. If, if a reporter calls and says, you know, you all launched your product a month ago, there's all sorts of uh, terrible reviews about it, bad customer service. Has your product failed? You don't want to respond, no, our product wasn't a failure. You want to respond, I view it very differently. Um, you know, I'm really proud of our team and the product that we launched. And yes, we're always looking to improve our product and we're going to take a lot of the feedback we get to make it even better. That is a better response. And it's because you pivoted back to kind of your key message that you're proud of your team, believe in your product and you're a, a, a source of innovation that's constantly improving. So I would kind of keep that in mind when you get tough, tricky questions. You don't have to accept the premise of every question that you are asked. Um, you can be respectful about it, but just say, I view that differently, or it's not a question of, of X. I, I view it more as a question of Y. And um, that kind of helps keep you on message while at the same time being responsive to the reporter. Um, in the don'ts column, you'll see some of the you know, usual stuff. Again, not getting too verbose not relying on acronyms. I had a client who was a fan, absolutely fantastic speaker in a room full of hundreds of people, the best I'd ever seen. Very different story when it came to actually sitting down and doing a television interview. And he would do television interviews and the reporter would go back to their truck and start editing and call me and say, I got nothing. I can't, I have no soundbite. <laughs> Even though like I would work with that client on like, let's keep it really simple for this TV interview. For some folks, it's harder than it may seem to kind of drop the acronyms um, and just keep it really simple. Um, and again, kind of keeping your audience uh, in mind. And again, you know, generally speaking, there's really not much of a reason to go off the record until you kind of have a degree of rapport and trust with a reporter. <clears throat> All right, so the rest of the day, your interview's done, you can breathe again. Uh, number one, kind of be responsive to any action items, send additional background. I think reporters, more than ever now, again, they're under-resourced, um, they're writing too many stories per day, they crave additional background, and it's good for you, your coverage as well. If you can send them studies, reports, you name it, um, additional sources they can talk to on a particular topic that just makes it easier for them to do their job of coverage, it's good for you. Uh, making sure you're clarifying everything. And then if it's going to be good coverage, think ahead, like, I want to amplify this. When I first got into this business, coverage, getting coverage was kind of the end of the life cycle, whereas today it's the beginning of the life cycle for that story. Like, think about how are you going to share this on, you know, from a social media perspective, your website perspective, uh, email marketing, 
you know, you name it. There's all sorts of examples now of where once you get a nice piece of coverage, um, it's the beginning of the life cycle of that article if you're being conscious and thoughtful about it. Um, if it's bad coverage, you know, we, we refer to this as rapid response. And you, you sometimes you'll have an idea going into it, uh, an interview, you know, what it's going to be like. But you can contact a reporter. If there's just basic inaccuracies, like you can see obviously online coverage within minutes of it um, appearing, you can contact the reporter and say, hey, this is factually inaccurate. Can you please change it? Nine out of 10 times they'll do it. Um, if it's more serious than that, where like for whatever reason you're just dealing with a bad news story um, and what you don't like is more a matter of interpretation rather than fact, um, there you need to think about kind of stakeholder outreach, fact sheets, letters to the editors, things like that to try to kind of mitigate any negative coverage. So, uh, but hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully you'll be spending a lot more time promoting your coverage uh, once it appears. Henry, question for you. And this is, as I'm getting back into the media side of things, I didn't realize that sometimes you can request to see a story before it goes into any kind of publication, whether it's print or digital. Is that becoming more commonplace? Is that something that we should always ask for? Or, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? I actually, um, I do it infrequently. Um, and again, sometimes you get a sense of, sometimes you get a sense of it just in talking with the reporter. If it's something that like, if it's sponsored content, yes, of course, you'll be seeing it and helping to edit it. Um, I will sometimes say if it's a new reporter or somebody who I can tell doesn't really fir have a firm grasp on the issue, I'll say if there are any specific sections or quotes you'd like for me to take a pass at, I'm happy to do it. I don't, uh, I don't think I've ever, I mean, I did once, like kind of insist on seeing something. Um, but again, going back to this idea that reporters don't work for you, they don't have to. Um, so I do it infrequently, to be honest. Um, I think as long as you have sent a lot of information and as long as they can make any corrections, um, they will do that. And if there are specific topics where you think maybe after the end of the interview, you still have concerns, they didn't fully grasp it. Yes, you can offer a more, I would, I would couch it in along the lines of appreciate you're fully independent and you can write what you want, but if it's helpful for me to, um, take a first pass at anything or a final review on anything to make sure it's accurate, I am happy to do so. Especially if when they reach you or when they reach out to you, it's more of, of a subject matter expert rather than you're the focus of this story, you know, we demand answers. In that case, they probably will have far less um, appetite to share it with you. But again, if you're more of a third party independent expert or something like that, yes, it's far more likely they'd be comfortable sharing it with you. All right, so that's it. Your day, your day is over. Congratulations, you completed your uh, your your media interview. Uh, I'd love to connect with with anybody uh, either who's watching here or is going to watch on LinkedIn. So uh, shoot me a LinkedIn connection or a Twitter connection if you want to connect over email. Uh, would love to chat. And whether whether it's through Andrew or through me, if you want a copy of the presentation, please don't hesitate to reach out. Happy to send it to you. Thank we'll you, Henry. We'll take a copy yeah. of the presentation that you were willing to send. Yeah. Hey, Mayor. And the other piece, too, kind of as a follow along, I mean, this was Media 101, what to do in reporter calls. Um, I would really like to bring Henry back for a crisis communications um, session, because if you know anything about media advisors, uh, crisis communications is what really gets their blood pumping. It does. I've, I've seen some extraordinary um, situations, uh, like just extreme executive misconduct, um, you name it. I've seen it all. And it's it's a look into human nature more than anything else. Um, it really is. And, and, and a look into kind of how organizations operate out of the public scrutiny and how kind of bad cultures can become toxic. Uh, and then that it spills out into the public. So yeah, crisis communications is, is again, a great window into, into human nature. And I'm confident that these folks will never have to deal with that. But I'm happy to provide a primer anyway. Have you been watching Super Pumped? Which is about Uber. I have not. Uh, as a person who is in, is uh, 
energized by that, their comms team, I feel so bad for because it was just train wreck after train wreck after train wreck. <laughs> yeah, without having seen it, I can sympathize with them already um, just by the way you describe it. I've been there. I will often tell people when, when there's an executive who's out there um, completely lighting themselves on fire from a PR standpoint and acting, you know, inappropriate. I will, I will constantly hear people saying, well, they need a better PR person. And I will say, no, trust me, very often the PR person is begging and pleading, you know, here are the things you need to do to make this right. And that person who generally is not used to being challenged says, no, I'm going to do this my way. And so I have great sympathy for most of the PR people out there who find themselves in that situation. Cause I know what it's like to, you know, have to work with folks who aren't used to being held accountable, um, especially in the private sector. If you're in the public sector, you're, you're held accountable by the Constitution. And so most of those folks are the ones that I worked for were absolutely, you know, the models of integrity. But in the private sector, that's not always the case. And um, yeah, sometimes it spills out into public and they don't know how to handle the accountability. Well, if you watch any show ever, you should watch that one. It is fascinating. I will. I will watch that. Any other uh, questions? No, this was great. Thank you so much. I look forward to getting that presentation. It'll be good. We'll, we have a big conference in the fall that we ramp up for, and there's always a you know, PR media push, and we'll get good. reached out to for things. And so this will be really good to have a nice, concise message and everything leading into that. So super helpful. Thank you. Excellent. Happy to hear it. It Thank is good. Thank you, Andrew, for putting it together. Oh, you're, you're welcome. And I was going to say, if any of you ever come down to Annapolis, it's a beautiful city. It's our state capital. Um, and Henry lives close by. And you can always buy him a cup of coffee and walk the, the brick and cobblestone streets and, and, and see it before it's underwater, right? Yeah, got to yeah. do it in the fall and get all the, the lowdown on all the elections, apparently. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Oh, man. I'm... <laughs> I am mercifully out of uh, out of the political business, but it, it is still great to, uh, to watch. We work with a, uh, a state board of elections, um, at, which we did during the, um, especially during COVID, where kind of the election process was turned on its head and everybody had to vote um, by mail, things like that. And so even though I'm out of politics per se, um, it's still great to be involved kind of in, in the the exercise of democracy. It's yep. a lot of fun. And that, and Henry, I, I'm, I'm going to reach out to you. I had for my product specifically around securing this upcoming little election that we have. Um, just advice you could give about how best to actually do that, because with my system in place, if someone was trying to mess around with our elections, we know about it in July of this year, not March of next year, which is my goal. And it's one of those things like we can do this tomorrow if we wanted to. I just don't know who to talk to to make that sort of thing happen. So, okay. Any other? Would be vastly appreciated. So thank yeah, you. I have some ideas. So I'd be happy to help. Okay, I'll reach out to you. And, uh, thank you. Yeah, it was great. Thank you, Andrew, for this. Really oh, you're welcome. I mean, the next one might be on honeybee health, and then we'll have Christina um, give a conversation about these mites, which are the ultimate uh, pest for honeybees. Absolutely. So, and I've got a bee theme going with my honey pop stuff. So you know, that's right. <laughs> Well, Henry, thank you again. I really do appreciate you doing this. I will um, put this up on the um, LinkedIn group. I'll make sure that all of you are invited to that LinkedIn group, as well as uh, distributing this to you via the emails that you put in the chat box. Thanks, everybody, for your time. It was great meeting you. And, uh, great meeting, everyone.